I was like, I don't want you to love me any more than what you're loving me. Because I feel like I can't take it. Like, I, I don't even know what that is. When somebody is in fear, it is almost impossible to receive love. And that is what you are meant to clear. That is what you have been clearing for many, many lifetimes. Welcome to the Akashic Recordings. I'm Annette Delu, Akashic Conduit, Channel, and Spiritual Guidance Coach. And I'm Julia Nalivaiko, storyteller and creative producer of conscious media content, such as this podcast. What you're about to hear is a real-life Akashic record session by Annette and one of her clients, recorded with their permission. For privacy, their names have been changed, but everything else is real. Stay tuned to the end of each episode where we deep dive into subjects that come up throughout the session. This is Jackie's first Akashic reading. She came into the session without any specific questions or topics to discuss. So Annette begins by doing a scan of her chakras or energy points. This gives her an indication of where Jackie is at energetically and helps set the course for the session. So one of the things that I'm seeing in your root chakra is it is very recessed and it is not emitting any light whatsoever. And typically what that shows me is that this is something that is from a previous lifetime. They're saying that this actually does contribute to one of the patterns that you have. For your root chakra, this is your stability. This is your feeling of home, your base instincts. It's your survival instincts kicking in. And what I'm seeing is that because your chakra is recessed, it's like you don't even have time to respond when something happens. So if there's something that is traumatic that happens or something that's upsetting or or hard, it's like you don't even know what to do. So you freeze. And so you don't really do anything. And then when that happens, it's creating a problem within yourself because you know you want to take some sort of action. You want to do something, but you just, you simply can't. You're just immovable. And that is not just physically, but emotionally, you're not able to sort of move past whatever that was. So we're going to try to unlock some of those energetic stuck places that you have going on. And once we can kind of start to unlock them and free them up a little bit, it'll help the energy to flow a little bit more freely and it'll help you to move through these energies. Now, one thing we want to get to the bottom of though is is why you're having the freeze response. And they're saying that this does contribute to your current lifetime and this is from a past lifetime that this happened. So we'll take a look at that. Then let's move that energy up to your sacral chakra, which is about two inches below your belly button. This is where your divine feminine power is. This is where your divine sexual energy, your creative energy, your manifestation energy. What I'm seeing is a ring of orange light, which is really beautiful and bright. And I'm seeing these tendrils, which sort of represent creativity. And they're not quite healthy yet. So like, it's like the base of them are healthy, but then they get into this space of dying before they ground into the 3D. So what I mean by that is that when you're trying to manifest something you want it to have show up in your life, it's almost like you almost get it and then it just falls short or it doesn't happen. And so we'll take a look at why that might be. Like, why is it that it's it's not quite grounding into reality? Oh, it's because of the root chakra being the way that it is at the moment. And we'll help clear that today. The root chakra helps whatever you're trying to manifest, whatever you're trying to create, helps root it into reality, into the 3D. And so when your your root chakra is sort of not functioning, which it isn't at the moment, that's what makes it hard to ground. So then let's move that energy up into your heart space. So they usually show me the heart as a metaphor, like a garden. It's like you're growing the plants and you're growing the the flowers and, and then all of a sudden it all just dies and it turns black. It's It feels a lot like every time you have hope or every time you have happiness in your life, it's like something comes by and just kind of squashes it. It is from a previous energy that has sort of followed you into this lifetime. It is an energy that does not belong. It is an energy that you sort of tied yourself to in a previous lifetime. 
And so we're going to have to cut the ties and we're going to have to clear that in order for this, this pattern to be removed from your life. The squashing of anything that she wants to have happen in her life. Is it actually coming from an outside source? It is. Okay. So it is coming from this energy. Yes. Would this be a curse of some sort? It is. Okay. It's a curse as well as a vow. She tied herself to this person who is actually doing this to her. Okay. Is this person incarnated in this lifetime? They are not. Okay. I'm hearing the words I want to speak, but I can't. The color of your throat chakra is like a, a deep, deep midnight blue, almost black. That has to do with the heart chakra thing that the, the curse that we're going to, we're going to clear. Okay. That makes sense. Do you have any questions about the, the chakra scan that we just did? I don't think I have any questions. I think you validated like what I've been feeling, like just going through my adult life, like feeling why I can't do these things. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with energy that's sort of, it's sort of like holding you back. Okay. So today we are going to open up the Akashic Records. I want to thank Akula, my Akashic guide for being here. Thank you for helping us with all of the messages that we need to hear today. Thank you to Archangel Metatron and Archangel Sandophon for allowing us access to the Akashic Records. Thank you. Okay. So the first place we're going to go is, is this, this lifetime where you have this vow and the curse. Okay. So the first thing that I'm seeing, and I'm getting that this is sort of towards the end of this particular lifetime that we're seeing, I'm seeing you in a large stone room. There's a circle above you in the ceiling. It's got a huge, huge dome and it's got a circle sort of cut out of the dome out to the sky. And I'm seeing like a beam of light coming in through that dome and it's the moon, it's the, the night sky. And you're sitting in the middle of the room, you're sobbing, you're trying to keep your faith, you're trying to keep positive at this moment, but it's really, really difficult right now because all you can see is the trajectory of your life moving forward and what it has been over the course of the last several months. And you're trying to make sense of it, you don't understand what has happened. You don't understand how you got to where you are right now. Okay, so they're sort of rewinding the images and the events that unfolded. And I'm seeing that you are quite beautiful. You have long black hair. It's tied up in a really beautiful way with a, a, a black hat of some sort. It's very elaborate. It's got some feathers on it and it's got some other things, but it's very beautiful. So you're walking down the street. You are clearly of some sort of status. You have wealth. You're with other people. And I'm hearing you say, oh, come on, let's let's get our, our palms read. It would be fun, like some sort of interesting thing to do. There's a woman who was doing fortune telling and palm reading and things like that. And so you thought it would be kind of cool to just sort of see what that was all about. She's saying to you that she sees that you have a very long lifeline in this particular life. She's saying, be careful that it doesn't get cut short. You have two paths that you can take at this time. You can take the path that you are currently on and you will live a very long life. You will live a very happy life. Or you could take the second path and there is nothing but destruction and pain and your life will end much sooner than you wanted it to. She tells you that both involve men both involve romance in some way. And you're asking her, how is it that you would know which one is which? If you meet one man, how are you supposed to know which one is the one where you're going to have a happy life and which one is the one that's going to end in disaster? And she says, that's the problem is that you won't know. You have to look within your heart and you have to choose with your intuition. The other indication I'm getting too is that the, the man that would be sort of ending in disaster like you would have much, much deeper feelings for this man than you would the other one. That was part of the ruse, so to speak, with this this particular man is that he kind of got you to really attach to him and fall in love with him. And that's how you ended up down the wrong path, so to speak. So let me ask, was this in fact the wrong path for her or was she actually meant to experience this? She was not meant to experience this. This was a, a path that was carved out based on the trajectory of her life and how she was living it. 
and the people that she was involved with. They were not particularly nice people. They were wealthy people. They were people who had status, but they were not heart-centered. They were not connected. She was also not as connected, not like she is today, but she was more connected than most of them. So you met the right man first. He was very kind to you. He was very sweet. He was not somebody who excited you, though. He was very straight and narrow. You could see the rest of your life moving forward with him. From the second you met him, you could see getting married, you could see having children, you could see having a house and running the house and having this trajectory of this society type life. And you saw this and you saw the predictability of it and you didn't want it. You met the second man. He was darker in energy. He was also much more handsome. He was more interesting. He was more worldly. He had traveled. He had things to say that you had never heard before. You were very enamored by him. The first man had proposed marriage to you. The second man had not, but he was still sort of keeping you on his leash, so to speak. He was doing enough to keep you interested. You eventually turned down the marriage proposal of the other man because you basically said, there's no possible way that I could feel about this man the way that I do about the the man that you were wanting to have ask you to marry you. And it was mainly because he was new and exciting and he had a very exciting life. It looked very exciting from the outside. He left. He was not staying in the place where you were living at the time. He was passing through when you met him. So he left and promised that he would write you, promised that he would come back to see you another time. He made you wait five years and you waited for him. You did not entertain dating anyone else or seeing anybody else or getting married. You waited for him. He did eventually come back for you five years later. And the way they're saying it to me is that he came back to collect you. He did not offer a proposal of marriage. He just offered to take you with him on his journeys. You agreed to this and he assured your parents that you would be well taken care of. He gave your parents a ton of money, like a lot, a lot of money. And I'm getting that he basically paid your parents off to to take you. You were not ever going to see your parents again after this. You were not going to see anyone you loved after this. I'm seeing you in a carriage and he's grabbing your throat and he's saying, you will do what I say. He's become incredibly abusive at this point, and this is where it's coming from. He's saying that you are bound to me. This is where the the commitment is coming in, so like the the vow. So he basically is saying you are bound to me. You are not to be anyone else's. You are not to look at anyone else, be with anybody else. You are mine and mine alone, and he made you vow as such. He was incredibly physically abusive to you. He was abusive in a way where he made sure to abuse you in a way that was not visible to outside people. You had to wear looser and looser clothing because of the bruises, the broken bones. He played mind games with you. It's like he made you do everything that he wanted you to do. And it was like, I'm seeing you on your hands and knees and he's making you almost like eat off the floor. It's really, really degrading, really awful. He's just doing it for his own pleasure. He had a lot of darkness in his heart. You tried to fight back a couple of times, but each time you ended up in this cell or this room, the room that we saw in the beginning of the vision, and he would leave you there for days and days and days on end with no food, no water, no anything. And it was almost as if he didn't care if you died in there. He really didn't. He just sort of left you there as long as he felt like he wanted to. So there were several curses that happened throughout. Anytime he got insecure about something, he would make you vow or promise something or like he would say, I'm cursing you to a life of solitude or whatever it happens to be. And when you say things like that in extreme anger and with that darkness that he had in his heart, they really did stick. Those curses did stick within your energy field. You were also so broken that you took them on yourself. The third time he put you in this stone room is that's the time that you died. He had left you in there and he had actually found another woman that he wanted to bring to his house. And it's almost as if he had forgotten about you. 
Like he literally forgot that he'd put you in that room because he was so wanting to sort of dominate this other woman. And it was, it was like you felt completely just not only abandoned, but discarded. In order to clear these vows, this connection to this man, we're going to put a bubble of divine light protection around you. And I'm going to ask Archangel Michael to clear any and all lower or negative energies, any entities, any energies from this man. I'd like you to imagine a beautiful field of grass and flowers. And I would like you to imagine that in front of you, there's a door. And I would like you to open the door and walk inside. And inside is your sacred space. It is a place where you are divinely protected. This is a place where your Akashic records are held. I want you to imagine that in in the middle of the space, there's a pedestal with a book. And inside the book are the signatures of every soul you've ever come across, every soul you've had any interactions with over the course of your entire soul's existence. And I would like you to imagine that version of yourself from this previous lifetime that we were just talking about. I want you to imagine that she is stepping forward into this space. I'd like to have you imagine that that version of you is signing the Akashic Records, releasing you from this experience, releasing you from any vows, any curses, any connections to this lifetime any energy that is connecting you to this lifetime, we're going to leave in the past, letting that energy be transmuted into light. Thank you. How are you doing? I know that was a lot. Can you just let me know what you're, what you're feeling right now? There's always been tightness in my chest, like a lot, for as long as I can remember. Like, but also, I've struggled with depression through my like adolescent and into my adult life and self-harming, like, like was like a really big thing and so I feel like that was like a part of it yeah like the like the vow or the curse or whatever like to try to get back to him in like some way shape or form yeah okay so tell me how does your chest feel right now do you feel did you feel that release how are you feeling yeah like I I feel like someone's not sitting on it it's like I constantly have felt like like an elephant was on my chest like it didn't matter what I was doing I didn't know if it was like anxiety like I had no idea what it was just like constantly feeling like I cannot breathe like my chest like bones and like everything was just like I just hurt all the time like yeah it was wild (laughs) wow so I want you to take a really deep breath right now so just inhale And exhale and just allow some of that energy to dissipate. I can see that part of the root chakra had to do with the lifetime we just covered, but it was only a small part. So we are going to cover one more lifetime that is having an effect on your root chakra. And then once we cover that lifetime, it should free you up to be able to start really grounding the things in life that you really, really want. Now, the biggest thing that they're showing me right now is that you are going to have to really look into your heart and start cultivating those things that you truly want because it's almost as if you haven't been able to allow yourself to want anything because you feel like it's just not going to come or that it's going to turn out bad or something is going to happen. It's going to be very much an exploration for you in What is it that you really, truly want to have in your life at this time? All right, so let's take a look at the lifetime we need to look at to clear the root chakra, please. Okay, how many lifetimes after this was it? Just one. Uh, Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so this root chakra issue is compounded into the, the next lifetime after the lifetime we just covered. It sort of created this almost paranoia in you. And so when you incarnated into the next lifetime. You knew it was going to be difficult because you knew that this was going to be a lifetime that you needed to start sorting out some of the trauma that happened. So what you did was you actually incarnated in possibly one of the easiest ways that you could have thought to incarnate. You incarnated in a place that had no war. You incarnated in a place that had no conflict at the time It was a very peaceful, peaceful place. And your family that you chose in that lifetime was, they were all very nurturing. They were all very loving. You felt like this black spot in the middle of all of it. You felt like you were not worthy 
of this beautiful place, of this beautiful family. You thought that there was something wrong with you, that there was something dark within you that didn't belong. You had this feeling of dread and that something bad was going to happen. And this is common after having a traumatic lifetime like this. We carry that energetic signature of that, that imprint, if you will, into the next lifetime. And so what we try to do is over the course of several lifetimes, we will take those periods of time and try to move through that energy as best as we can in order to dissipate the energy. So you set yourself up in a really beautiful situation in this life. The challenge was it was almost too beautiful because there was so much contrast between where you were, the family you had, and where you were feeling energetically. This was the first lifetime where you started feeling that flight, fight, or freeze. The freezing started happening. So like any time there was something that was potentially harmful or like I'm hearing like a really loud noise or anything like that, you were very jumpy. Anything scared you, like literally anything. Like you didn't want to go anywhere. You didn't want to do anything. And so like it just kind of kept you stuck in a lot of ways. You ended up staying at your parents' house. All of your siblings had gone. You ended up staying at your parents' house for quite some time because you felt safe there. Even though you felt kind of like the black sheep of the family, you still felt safe there. That You still felt that you were accepted and loved, but you still felt this darkness within you and you didn't understand where it came from. The whole rest of this next life was really easy. Nothing bad happened to you. You lived to a pretty advanced age, but you you basically spent your whole life looking over your shoulder. Like you were so worried and scared that something bad was going to happen that you just created that worry and it made that life really unpleasant for you. So even in the best of circumstances, you couldn't live a really beautiful life because you couldn't see the beauty in it because all you saw was the fear. So you can see from that lifetime the perspective of where we are energetically, how much it affects how we perceive our own world and where you could have somebody else who had signed up for that lifetime, that exact lifetime that you just had, where you had the supportive family and the beautiful place to live. And somebody could have lived their absolute best life in that lifetime because they were able to appreciate and see the beauty in all of it. But if you're not able to receive that beauty, you're not able to receive that love. When somebody is in fear, it is almost impossible to receive love. And that is what you are meant to clear. That is what you have been clearing for many, many lifetimes. So do you have any questions about that? How many lifetimes has it taken for me to even try to work on it, I guess? I'm like aware of it. I'm becoming aware of it now. Like it's a fear. Yeah. So how many lifetimes ago did the original trauma happen? Six lifetimes ago. Okay. So then the the lifetime we were just talking about, that was five lifetimes ago. So then it's been the last several lifetimes she's been working on this. Yes. What is it that we need to do to help her clear the rest of the root chakra? Okay. Archangel Michael says he's already on it. Okay. He's already helping you clear it. Is it going to take a while? It's going to take about six weeks. Okay. So Archangel Michael is actually going to hang out with you for that long. I mean, he can hang out with you for longer if you'd like, but at the very least, he's going to help sort of clear out your root chakra. So that's going to take a little while. So is there any other clearing that we need at this moment? Throat chakra. Okay. What do we need to do to clear that? Okay. So they're showing me from that previous lifetime, the the one where the, the trauma happened, that when you were in the stone room, you were screaming and screaming and screaming, hoping somebody would hear you. It got to the point where you just, you gave up because you just figured nobody was ever going to hear you. You actually didn't really even know what was around you. Like wherever you were, wherever he took you in the stone room was, was separated from where you had lived. So like you didn't really know where you were. I'm hearing waves. It was by the sea somewhere. You could hear the waves outside, so you didn't know how isolated you were, but that's part of the reason why nobody would be able to hear you is because of the waves. This translated into many lifetimes of you feeling like you could never be heard. So it's like you gave up on even speaking. You gave up on even expressing yourself because why bother if nobody's going to hear you? 
And I want you to understand that that is absolutely false when it comes to this lifetime. This is simply the trauma that happened back then. And so you can speak in this lifetime. You can be heard and understood and loved in this lifetime. It is absolutely something that you can experience in this life. It's just about letting go of this past lifetime, understanding where it came from and letting go of the energy. So I'm going to ask Archangel Michael if he can help clear the throat chakra as well. Yeah, he said he's already on it. Okay, great. Thank you. And just to let you know, he's not tied to any religion. He's just, he is just him and he is here to help. And he is one of our, our beautiful archangels and he transcends all religion. So he helps anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. Okay. So now we're going to move into life purpose. Life purpose is, is actually pretty easy. Your life purpose in this lifetime has been to get out from under this darkness. That is your main goal in this lifetime is to be able to get out from under it. You incarnated in a family in this lifetime that is supportive of this. So in other words, you very much stacked the deck when you chose the family to incarnate with. You basically said, all right, I need all the light workers I can to be able to help me through this lifetime so I can finally clear this once and for all. So you signed up for the experiences in this lifetime to be able to really acknowledge it. And they're showing me the self-harm. It's a manifestation of the memory of that previous lifetime. So basically it was your higher self kind of creating this discord within you to remind you this is something you need to address. I want you to really pay attention to that aspect of your consciousness at this time. So now that you're aware of these lifetimes, I really want you to connect in and see if that energy has dissipated. Because I imagine that over the course of time, that need in self-harm is going to dissipate based on this because the reminder of it is there to say, hey, I'm here. Don't forget about me. It's that that darker energy that was within your energy field that's saying, don't forget about me. This is still here. So connect into your heart space. And actually, I would like you to do that right now, if you don't mind. I just imagine a cord of light coming from the top of your head through your brain. Imagine that cord of light going all the way down into your heart space. And I would like you to ask your heart how it's feeling right now. Ask your heart if it has anything to say to you right now. And were you able to hear something? Yes. There was a dark figure that like lived within me and we don't have that anymore and he's not screaming anymore. Oh, that's amazing. Anything else? You know, because he was like a big part of being able to like love anybody, being able to be in friendships, like any relationship, like anything because i'm in a relationship now so being mm -hmm. feeling like i can actually be with him because i was like i don't want you to love me any more than what you're loving me because i feel like i can't take it like I, I don't even know what that is but having some validation on why i literally just was freaking about love like and just feeling safe or committed to anybody even like my own family it's like it's like relieving like i don't I don't have such a heavy feeling on her anymore. Oh, that's amazing. So your your life's purpose has been essentially to just clear this. And so you're well on your way. And once this is fully cleared, and once you start moving into new energy, your life is going to look like night and day. I'm really seeing that like this portion of your life is is sort of like in the dark. And then after a certain point, once the healing is complete, it's like the sunshine is coming out and you're going to be able to see the daylight. And then from that point, it is literally about you discovering what makes you happy, discovering your psychic gifts, discovering your own inner spirituality, all of that. Like that's just going to be icing on the cake and, and what you're going to be moving towards. 
that can be <laughs> that could be a a blessing and it can be daunting at the same time because you know when you have your whole world opened up to you meaning that like you basically the sky's the limit you can do whatever you want sometimes when the options are limitless that can be a little bit daunting as well so make sure you just take the time just you know go with the flow of the universe really connect in with what you truly really want for your life and allow that to be changeable. So you might want something now and then maybe in two years, maybe you don't want the same thing. Maybe you want something different and that's okay. Okay. So the question that I have for you is, do you have anyone in your life right now that you would like to take a look at in terms of your relationship, why they're in your life, that type of thing. Yeah, the person that I'm with now, my boyfriend now, only because he's someone who, he like works with me through my things and I haven't, like no one has met me that way before as sort of like wanting to help me, wanting to figure out like all the unanswered questions or like why I'm like this. No one has met me there before like they've all just said like you're crazy or like anything like that like all the the emotions that I have and things like that they Mm -hmm. just like write it off like they're not like questioning me or like trying to figure out or anything like that like why I am the way that I am kind of thing he has said that he wants to love me and like I've never really like wanted to be loved by anybody is he part of her soul family? He is not. He is a soulmate that has come in to help her. Okay. He has been helping her for many lifetimes. Okay. So we're going to take a look at the lifetime just before this one. He has been trying to win your heart for several lifetimes. This last lifetime, I'm just seeing him. He's walking forward and he's offering you his arm and then you just stop. And like, you're not grabbing his arm. You're just kind of looking at him and you're saying what? And he goes, well, grab my arm. You're like, I don't know if I want to. And he's like, it's just an arm. And you're like, are you sure it's just an arm? And he's like, yeah, it's just an arm. (laughs) And you're like, okay. So you put your hand in his arm and you walk sort of arm in arm down the street. And you're looking at him sort of suspiciously. You're like, I don't know if I trust this. I don't know if I trust that like It is what he says it is, right? And so he's trying to make you feel at ease. He's trying to make you feel comfortable in terms of giving you the space that you need. I am also hearing him say, I will, I will wait for you forever. Why did he say that? He was so deeply in love with her in this particular lifetime that this was something that he would say to her on a regular basis. He's a soul that is somebody that you met prior to the traumatic lifetime was he the the other man that she was supposed to spend her life with in that lifetime yes aha <laughs> so he was the he was the nice man he was the the boring one <laughs> the boring one that you didn't choose he has shown up consistently in your life with very very consistent energy in every single lifetime you've been together so he hasn't had any sort of wavering in terms of how he feels about you. His soul is very stable. It's very solid, very grounded. He's trying to remind you who you are. So then you can do the same for others. Okay. So then can we know what their soul contract is with this lifetime? We don't want to tell you the entire soul contract. It could potentially affect the trajectory of what they are meant to do together. But their recovery at this time is the utmost importance because even though he did not go through the trauma that she did, he has been working very, very hard to help her out of it. It's almost as if when you have somebody dive into an ocean to save a drowning person, they both come out of the ocean exhausted. And that is exactly what is happening at this time. So they both need some time to rest and to recover. And once they have rested and recovered, then they can move forward in their collective mission together, which that's the part that we are not going to share with you at this time. Okay. How did that feel, hearing the information? Where did that land? It felt good to know (laughs) that I have a soul out there willing to help me and that, like, that's why I've been, like, pushing him away in in a sense because, like, I haven't cleared that past trauma but also why he tries so hard like why he just why he just tries so hard the the image that they're giving me is again that image of somebody saving a drowning person 
So if you imagine like he jumped into the ocean to save you, he pulled you out of the ocean, you're both exhausted and he sees that you're not breathing. And so he leans over to give you mouth to mouth resuscitation. And so he does that. And the second he does, as you're like choking and gasping and trying to catch your breath, it's like you're pushing him off of you. Like you're like, get off of me. Like I give me some room. I need to like breathe, you know? So like that's kind of the space that you're in right now. Yeah, because like I, I just it almost feels like because I haven't had that like that breath of fresh air kind of thing, and so like now that he's giving it to me, I just I just need a second. Like yeah, like you're saying, like I just yeah, I need to collect myself, and then I can give right. you all of my time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And if if you feel guided to, you know, it's up to you how much you want to share with him, but. If you want to at least share this portion of the recording with him, they're saying that he might get a kick out of it and he might appreciate that. I'm sure he will, yes. Because <laughs> going into this, he was like, well, if you break up with me tomorrow, and I was like, oh my goodness, he was like, I'm just saying, he was like, you don't know what you're going to find out. <laughs> 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 exactly. Yeah. It, that kind of thing happens a lot where people have a lot of fears surrounding going into sessions like this because they feel like maybe something will change or something will shift. And most of the time things do change and shift, but you get context, right? You get context of how things are going to move forward. And the thing is, is that you knew coming into this session, you knew your feelings for him and you knew where he stood energetically for you. It's just having somebody else echo that information back at you is is helpful because you're like, yeah, okay, that validates what I've been feeling. How do you feel? I feel a lot better. Good. Thank you so much. You're welcome, my dear. I'm sending you tons and tons of love. Okay, so we're going to close the Akashic Records. I would like to Thank Akula, my Akashic guide. I want to thank my guides, Archangel Metatron, Archangel Sandalphon, Archangel Michael, for being here today and helping with all of this information and the healing. The records are closed. The records are closed. The records are closed. We want to acknowledge and thank Jackie for her courage and willingness to be vulnerable and allow us to record her session. Annette, how is the session for you? This was a really intense session. There was a lot to be cleared. And oftentimes when there are curses involved, that is also incredibly intense for me because I have to sort of overcome some of my own fears of whatever spirits or entities we're going to come across. What is there to be afraid of in those types of situations? Ultimately, there's nothing to be afraid of, but there is a lot of ancestral and societal fears that come along with working with spirits, mediumship. I definitely had a lot of that fear instilled upon me growing up Catholic. The whole issue of demons and of possessed souls and all of that stuff was all very Hollywood in my head. So that kind of stuff has always been an issue for me. It's been something that I've had to work through for quite a long time to be in a space of conquering those fears of working with spirits who are in shadow, who are in that space of darkness and being able to help them to either release curses or to cross over. But it's interesting because usually Akula, my Akasha guide, will warn me ahead of time. So the second I open the records, he'll be like, this is going to be tough for you. It's okay. Don't worry. We'll get you through it, but it's going to be tough. Or he'll say, this one is going to be graphic or you're going to see graphic things. And in which case I'll ask him, can you please present it to me in a way that's not going to give me nightmares? And they're very respectful of making sure that it's in a way that I can handle. So what was the warning that you received on this session? This session, I didn't receive a warning per se, but I knew that there was a curse that was going to be coming in. Like I could feel it the second we dove in. It's a disjointed energy. It's, a, it's like a, a shadow energy that's attached to her energy that doesn't belong to her. And she kind of confirms this later on in the session when she was talking about the dark figure that she had in her heart that's always been there. Oh, I just got chills when yeah, you were talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean that we just got chills? Confirmation that it was real, that it happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Since we've 
delved straight into the subject matter of curses. Obviously, that's something that we need to talk about because that was kind of a big part of what just unfolded. So curses have connotations from old days and, and it's connected to religious fears and propaganda, dark magic and dark energy and stuff like that, which, you know, from what I'm hearing you say, that's not the case. Can you talk us through what a curse is in reality? Well, I mean, ultimately it's manifestation. When you think about the fact that we're always manifesting throughout the course of every second of every lifetime, that a curse is simply an intentional manifestation, but in shadow. Sometimes a curse can be words set out of extreme anger over and over again. So if you want to take, let's say, an abusive parent who is constantly telling you that you're no good or that you're not smart or whatever it happens to be, that can be a curse because they're repeatedly saying something to you and you're taking that on as your own. Those types of curses are, are a little bit easier to clear because they are what I would call sort of unintentional curses. They're not actual curses that we would typically see as witches cast or things like that. They are simply situational as per the contract or whatever experience you've signed up to, to have in a particular lifetime or even maybe a, an experience you didn't sign up to have but you had anyway. Oftentimes when I have those types of curses, when I have to ask the other party to clear the curse, it's usually very easy and they're very willing to do so. When it comes to curses that we would typically think of like a witch would cast, it is not just about what our stereotype of witches would be. Because I mean, from the definition, I would be a witch, so would you, you know, like all of us would be. But it is it is more so of the intention. So it's a manifestation. So for example, I do crystal grids to amplify my manifestations. So I basically set up the crystals, set up the grid, put my energy into it, add some elements to it. Sometimes I'll add flowers or various things to amplify the, the manifestation. That would be considered a spell, if you will. It's not a spell. It's just an amplified manifestation. But the curse is the same thing. So essentially, if you're doing like a crystal grid or if you're burning words, like you write down words on a piece of paper and you're burning them or you do some sort of ceremony or you do something where they would use blood magic and things like that back in the day, if you do these types of things, it's essentially manifesting your will, but it's not just for the, the greatest good of your life or the greatest good of all. You're actually trying to impede somebody's free will. That's essentially what the curse does is it permeates through the person's experience. Now, the intention of the curse makes a difference on whether or not it is going to have a big effect or a small effect. I've seen curses that have lasted over 20 different lifetimes for somebody, which is unusual because typically we naturally clear things as we live these lifetimes. As a general rule, we're usually only clearing things from the last maybe seven to 10 lifetimes because we are constantly clearing. So to have something go back 20 lifetimes is usually pretty significant, and that's usually a pretty strong curse. When that happens, the person who casts those curses, oftentimes I'll see they would have done this to a lot of different people. Not always, but sometimes that happens, where then their soul is in such guilt and shame over what they had done. When they die, their soul gets stuck and doesn't cross over. When that happens, when I'm trying to clear the curse, I have to speak to that soul who hasn't crossed over, who is in shadow. People would consider that to be those lower souls, those scary souls, those things, right? So that's sort of the Hollywood version that I that I needed to sort of overcome in order to be able to do this work. And I've been shown over and over and over again, like there's literally nothing to be afraid of. And I totally get that. And there's still there's still a little element of that in me, though. There's still a little tiny bit of fear that I'm still working through when those things happen. Well, it's good to know that you're only human. Yes. Sometimes it's easy to forget that, what with the amount of wisdom that you're able to impart. <laughs> so these souls that are in shadow, you say that there is nothing to be fearful of, but what is the experience of talking to them? They like to try to scare me. I have experienced it where they like try to get in my face. They, you know, try to 
show me things that are scary. It's kind of like the boogeyman. I have a tendency to put up much stronger barriers of protection. I have a tendency to be a little bit more cautious in that way. Okay. So there's that, that's where it comes from, this perception that it is something to be fearful of is because there is this element of like them trying to be scary, even though there isn't actually anything that they can do. Yeah. And I've never quite asked them why they're presenting that way. You and I watched the Pixar movie Soul together because I was showing you how that is a really good representation of what it means to have that psychic debris and have that shadow energy encased in your entire energetic field and how that can present like a demon or like some sort of spirit or entity. And so that's exactly what it is. Like inside that scary exterior is a pure soul who is really hurting. That is what I'm trying to do in these sessions, which is to get to the heart of that soul and help them to understand that they've died, maybe to help them cross over. Sometimes I can help them, sometimes I can't. But then to, at the very least to help them remove the curse, because the thing is, is that if they agree to remove the curse, that actually helps them clear their energy that would actually take them one step closer to being able to cross over. The perception of what hell is, I've heard it said that that's pretty much it. The said lost souls that you're referring to as they're encapsulated by like the worst of their experiences from their lifetime. That is what we have come to perceive to be hell. Yeah. It's not a place. It is something of your own creation. Yeah. So once you've had this interaction with the souls of the relevant parties and they've agreed to release the curse. And I mean, we've observed this in Jackie's episode that she literally felt like an entity like released from her chest. What does that come from? Like energetically speaking, what happens in order for her to have that experience? The interesting thing is, is that when I get reactions like that from clients, it's always a surprise to me. I, I don't know how it's going to present for them. And I, I don't know how it's going to release for them because it really depends on how much of the curse is still left in their body, how much energy is connected to that. It depends on a lot of things. So yeah. So when I hear the client say, yes, when you did that clearing, I felt the release. It's pretty powerful and, and it's great validation how that happens, it's an energetic thing. So, I mean, energy can be cleared in a second. It really can be. We hold on to it for so many reasons. Our souls do. We hold on to energy that we don't need for so many reasons. And so the, the ability to let go of it is sort of our natural state, if you will. Setting the intention and getting the, the person who casts the curse to release it is the very act of being able to release it. Now, a lot of this lifetime had been sort of permeating through Jackie's experience, but it wasn't necessarily the curse that was shaping her experience in this current lifetime. It was some of the other traumas that she experienced in that life, but it wasn't necessarily the curse that was having a super big effect on her. But sometimes we will showcase a particular item such as this shadow in her heart that she said she felt, we will showcase that because it is our soul's reminder that, hey, this is something we need to work on. It was like an external manifestation of this energy that had been present with her all this time. Yeah. 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 It's specifically, it's this negative energy that really like creates the curse and gives it its power. Why is it that only negative energy that has this effect? Why can't someone wish us super well in a lifetime and why can't stay with us for, you know, 10 other lifetimes? This is something that is hard to see because if we have good energy or abundant energy, we're not going to complain about it. And we're also not going to necessarily notice it if it's consistent throughout. Mm -hmm. It's true that no one's ever going to come to a medium. They're never going to complain about, geez, I've just had all this good luck in my life. And, you know, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, like that's, totally. that's stuff we just take for granted. And we only ever go to try and resolve issues that seem like problems in our lives. I have actually had clients come to me and ask me, can you please tell me a life where I was successful in this thing? It is something that we can do. We can tap into previous lifetimes where you were really abundant or really successful, and then you can tap into that energy. So I have had people ask me about those types of lifetimes. Like, usually it's in frustration, though. Usually it's like, 
it's not happening for me now in this lifetime. Did I ever have a lifetime where X, Y, and Z happened? And I'm like, okay, most likely, yes, because most of the people that are coming to me for Akashic Sessions are older souls and have been here for quite some time. Let's move on to some of the other things that came up in uh, Jackie's session. So this one, as you know, resonated a lot for me because some of the chakra issues that Jackie was experiencing was also what I had experienced. You and I had a session a little while ago where the same thing came up for me as well, a similar thing, where my root chakra had been fractured in a previous lifetime, incidentally also linked to a man with a rather dark energy that I had given a lot of my energy to. And this resulted in a similar consequence in that you told me that my chakra was also inactive in this lifetime. Can you talk a little bit about the effect of the root chakra in our lives? What does it do and why do we need it to be active and functional? That is a really good baseline for understanding what these past lives do and how they affect us. When I do the chakra scan and I see like a dark spot or sometimes I'll see something like rotting in the in the root chakra, basically that is showing me where the chakras are in relation to the past lives. So it gives me my information that I need. Is it really going to have a huge effect on the person in their chakra system now in their current lifetime? Not always. It's not always going to show up as a physical sensation in your body. It's going to show up in different ways. Sometimes it can show up as a physical sensation for your root chakra, let's say. That's going to be your feeling of safety and security. It's going to be your foundation. It's going to be your sense of home, what you call home. It's going to be those base instincts of flight, fight, or freeze. Any of those feelings that you get when it comes to like your safety being threatened or anything like that, it can mean different things for different people. But in general, that's what it's going to rule. One realization that I did have, though, is that throughout my entire life, now it's worth mentioning that, you know, my life has involved a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. So as a child, my family, we moved around a lot. Then in my adult life, I still moved a fair bit. Like I have certainly have not spent my whole life in one place, one job with one group of people. Like I feel like I've lived many lives already. And so looking back at that history, I've never really had a feeling of of being rooted and grounded and being in a place where I belong. That I think is a pretty good reflection of, yeah. of what you're talking about in terms of the chakra issue, because that's just how the way my life unfolded. And it unfolded that way due to something that I was unaware of and had happened a long time ago. Well, and there's also the the aspect of what is home for you individually. You really loved being a nomad. You really loved van life when you were in Australia. I did. That could be your sense of safety and security and home. Even though it's nomadic, it doesn't necessarily need to be staying put in one spot in order for it to be healthy for you. It's very much about not only getting to the bottom of what might be holding you back in these blockages in the the chakras and also what is aligned for you. And that is something that these blockages can also do is hide the energy that you are meant to be in. So it doesn't mean that you have to do things the way that everybody else is doing them, that the idea of safety and security means X, Y, and Z, but that you're able to define your own version of that, whatever that looks like. If in the past you haven't been able to define that yourself and that you felt that maybe decisions were being just made for you, but now you feel a little bit more empowered or in control over the decisions you're making that could be the shift and change that happens, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because that definitely is a reflection of how I felt before. Like I didn't really have much input into what happened in my life. Like it just sort of unfolded. Okay, so with this root chakra becoming active, what I've heard you say is that it also affects the rest of the chakras. So without a solid grounding to the chakras, the other ones are not able to function properly or or as well as they could. Why does that matter? I mean, the easiest way to describe it, it's like a bottleneck 
So it's very rare that I'll see darkness in the upper chakras. So the crown, the third eye, those you'll see mostly either it's going to be open or closed. There's not a lot of darkness in there. So if you imagine the energy of the higher realms coming in through the crown chakra and then going to your third eye, then to your throat chakra, from your throat chakra to your heart, to your solar plexus, to your sacral, to your root. If any one of those are blocked along the way, that energy is going to get stuck. And so basically that that divine energy, that energy that's coming in through the crown isn't able to reach the rest of the chakra system. It's a little bit like a circuit. If some of your fuses are blown, the light's not going to turn on. When I see blockages, the guides will tell me if the blockage in the heart chakra and the sacral chakra are from the same lifetime. And sometimes they'll show me that connection if, if it's pertinent. Does it really make a difference for the client to know about the chakra blockages? No. I mean, unless they themselves actually do chakra work, energy work, where they can help clear their own bodies themselves, then, you know, that could be helpful information for them. But if they don't do that stuff themselves, it's mainly information for me so I know where to clear. And then you'll hear me in certain sessions ask some of the Ascended Masters, angels, archangels to help with the energy clearing. So when we talked about the effect of the not functional root chakra in relation to her other chakras and, and how it manifested in her life, the examples that you brought was like her inability to bring something to fruition in a full way in life, like something was almost going to happen and it didn't happen. And then, you know, something really good came into her life and then it was taken away and, and these types of things. Is that like typical of how that manifests? 100%. Yeah. That's going to be your grounding, your ability to ground things into 3D reality. And mainly because when your root chakra is not healthy, it's going to have a lot of fear. It's going to have a lot of lower energies. And what is the best way to stop a manifestation? Doubt and fear. Well, that I can certainly speak to because I feel like fear of failure has definitely followed me around for a long time in my life, which incidentally hasn't necessarily stopped me from trying things or doing things, some of which have eventuated to a certain extent, but it makes it much, much harder to to do those things and it, it really changes the experience and the energy of doing the things. So instead of doing them in lightness and joy and the pleasure of creating, it really becomes about like, will it be good enough? What trajectory will it have in the world once it's finished? And that is just never a, a, a good way to approach an endeavor. Not a good way to approach an endeavor, but sometimes it's the only way to do it. That's how you move through this energy. So yes, you can get clearings, you can get sessions, you can do all of these things to help clear these things from your chakra system, but how... Most people clear their chakra system is exactly what you're talking about. They go through those fears. Let's talk a little bit about the actual trauma that she experienced in this particular past life. It was, you know, it wasn't her fault what she experienced, the human being that she was. It was not her fault. She simply made some not great decisions and ended up in this situation where this man abused her and really traumatized her. She was the victim. So if we're talking about in injustice terms, you know, she should have suffered this one lifetime and then should have walked away from it lighter and, and having a better life. And maybe that's a point of view that's completely like, not based on how the universe works, but there is just a feeling like, what's the sense in that? There are different schools of thought on this. There are religions and belief systems that are based in the karma dharma structure, which, you know, if you put good out in the world, good will come back to you. If you put bad out in the world, that's what comes back to you. And that is true to a certain extent, of course. And I want to preface this by saying this is just my opinion and my experience of what I've seen in the records. So if other people have other ideas and opinions, I'm not negating those. I'm just simply saying from my perspective, there is no punishment reward system in the universe. It is not a, I do something and therefore I get punished for it. I did something or I had something done to me. So therefore I deserve to have X, Y, and Z. It just doesn't work like that. 
So she experienced this particular lifetime that was very, very traumatic. So when she went to the other side and had her life review and set up for her next lifetime, I mean, you could say from that perspective, the next lifetime she experienced was a reward in a way. I mean, if you want to look at it that way, because she basically set herself up with a lifetime that was really easy so she could get over this trauma. Well, we were talking about earlier the shadow and the contrast of shadow. And for her, that contrast was just too great between the shadow she was feeling within herself and this idyllic life she had created for herself in this this next lifetime. From her perspective, that's not an ideal life. That's actually a version of hell that is unfolding for her because she does not feel connected to what it is that she was experiencing. She couldn't enjoy it because she had so much turmoil going on within her. You know, sometimes people sign up for vacation lifetimes and you can do that from time to time. There is an element of recovery that is sort of built into some lifetimes as well. But from the perspective of the the man who did this to her in that that traumatic lifetime, did he get punished for that? No. He may have punished himself for doing what he did. That soul may have. But there is no outward punishment that I have seen. To go back to that question then, we know her what her experience has been. And we know that she has been carrying this energy for many lifetimes about the man, the perpetrator. Is it possible that, you know, after having done this, he could have gone on to have a great lifetime a couple of lifetimes later? Like, is one worse than the other? Well, the first thing is, is that, you know, we can only see what his experience was with her because we were in her records. So I can't see what is in his record. So I don't know what his experience is now moving forward. I don't know if he was able to clear enough for himself that he's able to then incarnate in a better life. I don't know any of these things, right? But it has everything to do with how evolved the soul is. So for example, if you have a soul that is incredibly evolved, which I've met several people on this planet who have already gone through their ascension process. So if you want to take the most famous one, which would be Jesus, he went through his ascension process way back when. So I have known people who have gone through their ascension process like Jesus. And when you go through the ascension process and you complete it, you're done. You don't ever have to come back here if you don't want to. But a lot of people decide to come back here because they want to help. And they want to come back and and help other souls with their ascension and things like that. So I've met more than a couple of people who are on their second go around and their second soul purpose. And those people who have an inherently higher level or a higher frequency of energy, if they come down and they play a villain in somebody's story, they are much more likely to be able to cross over and have zero guilt, zero shame, zero psychic debris, like that's going to keep them earthbound. It's just, it's an experience. They play the role down here. They cross over, they shed all of it very quickly, and they go back to being the pure divine soul that they are. And I've seen it where a higher level soul will come down to earth to be the contrast, to be able to affect change. And I think that that's sometimes very, very hard for people to wrap their brains around because it's hard to understand that Sometimes the villains in our stories aren't being punished for their crimes. This is reminding me of, I believe it was Conversations with God, a well-known book in the spiritual circles, where a chapter was titled Hitler Went to Heaven. And I think it was more of an attention-grabbing way of making the exact point that you're making, that sometimes people come in to play a role you know, be it in the life of one person or or on a global scale, but to play a role that needs to be played in order for a storyline to unfold and for the things that need to come to the surface to do so. So, okay, back to Jackie. You just mentioned before that she chose a vacation lifetime in life that immediately followed the trauma. However, it didn't quite pan out that way because, as you said, the contrast was too stark, which I compounded the issue. So was that like a mistake on her soul's part to have chosen such a light-filled lifetime? We don't always know what's going to happen 
when we come down here. So we make the best decisions we possibly can for learning the lessons we need to learn or having the experiences we need to have. We can maybe have a, a, a close approximation of what we're going to do and decisions we'll make based on previous lifetimes. But we're all rogue down here. You know, we make all kinds of crazy decisions for no reason. We try to do the best that we can based on what we can kind of see as far as the possible timelines and trajectories. This is why predicting the future is so hard too, because you may predict the future right now, but then by your own free will decisions, you could change things that happen. I have to say that I genuinely enjoy the answer of, you know, the souls try to do the best we can and then watch the humans do. God knows what with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like watching cats, you know, like you're just like, okay, uh, put a bunch of boxes in the middle of the living room and see, see which box they choose. Or more to the point, put a bunch of comfortable beds in the, in the middle of the living room and see the cats go sit in the cardboard boxes. I yeah. love the idea of us humans doing that. And, yeah. you know, the, the beings on the other side just sitting there shaking their heads yes. going, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, I've got the free will, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you again for everything that we discussed today. And Jackie, we, we wish you a life filled with love going forward. And thank you to Lucius for his ample participation. Always thank you to Lucius. Always. Thank you so much for listening to our very first official episode of the Akashic Recordings. I wanted to put a little side note in the outro today about Mr. Lucius, the interdimensional fantastic cat. Some of you may have seen on my Instagram that I did lose Mr. Lucius two weeks ago, and he has been such an integral part of my life for so long. I had him for 16 years, and he's also one of my spirit guides, and he is dearly, dearly missed. You will hear some of his meows on the upcoming episodes because they were recorded previously to his crossing over. So enjoy his interaction for the next few episodes. But I wanted to address his lack of presence after that. If you would like to get in touch with either Julia or myself, feel free to head to my website at infinitesoullove.com. And you can go to the contact page and fill out a form. And Ask whatever questions you would like to ask. Give us feedback on the podcast. Whatever is on your mind, feel free to send us a message. You can also follow me on all social media at Infinite Soul Love 1111. And that is on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Thanks so much and see you next week. <laughs>